Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Oh, God, to hear the insect and the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke, and trembling cast his eyes upon the ground. But he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, said Mrs. Cratchit, not for his. Long life to him. Merry Christmas and a happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, from the mere relief of Scrooge the Baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business. Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a stretch, and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest. Tomorrow being a holiday, she passed at home. Also how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts in the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song— about a lost child travelling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice, and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. Peter might have known, very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded— looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting. Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. By this time it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily, and as Scrooge and the spirit went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires and kitchens, parlors, and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. Here the flickering of the blaze showed preparations for a cozy dinner, with hot plates baking through and through before the fire and deep red curtains, ready to be drawn to shut out cold and darkness. There all the children of the house were running out into the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, aunts, and be the first to greet them. Here again were shadows on the window blind of guests assembling, and there a group of handsome girls, all hooded and fur-booted and all chattering at once, tripped lightly off to some near neighbor's house, where, woe upon the single man who saw them enter, artful witches, well they knew it, in a glow." but if you had judged from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings, you might have thought that no one was at home to give them welcome when they got there, instead of every house expecting company and piling up its fire as half chimney high. Blessings on it how the ghost exulted, how it bared its breadth of breast and opened its capacious palm and floated on, outpouring with a generous hand its bright and harmless mirth on everything within its reach. The very lamplighter, who ran on before, dotting the dusky street with specks of light, and who was dressed to spend the evening somewhere, laughed out loudly as the spirit passed, though little kenned the lamplighter that he had any company but Christmas. And now, without a warning from the ghost, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor. 
where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about, as if they were the burial place of giants. The water spread itself wheresoever it listed, and would have done so but for the frost that held the prisoner. And nothing grew but moss and furs and the coarse rank grass. Down in the west the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red, which glared upon the desolation for an instant like a sullen eye, and frowning lower, lower, lower yet, was lost in the thick gloom of darkest night. "'What place is this?' asked Scrooge. "'A place where miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth,' returned the spirit. "'But they know me. See!' A light shone from the window of a hut, and swiftly they advanced towards it. Passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful company assembled round a glowing fire. An old, old man and woman, with their children and their children's children, another generation beyond that, all decked out gaily in their holiday attire. The old man, in a voice that seldom rose above the howling of the wind upon the barren waste, was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very old song when he was a boy, and from time to time they all joined in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man got blithe and loud, and so surely as they stopped, his vigor sank again. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold his robe, and passing on above the moor, sped whither, not to the sea, to sea. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land, a frightful range of rocks behind them, and his ears were deafened by the thundering of water as it rolled and roared and raged among the dreadful caverns it had worn, fiercely tried to undermine the earth. Built upon a dismal reef of sunken rocks some league or so from the shore, on which the waters chafed and dashed the wild year through, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of seaweed clung to its base, and storm-birds, born of the wind one might suppose as seaweed of the water, rose and fell about it like the waves they skimmed. But even here two men who watched the light had made a fire that through the loophole in the thick stone wall shed out a ray of brightness on the awful sea. Joining their horny hands over the rough table at which they sat, they wished each other Merry Christmas in their can of grog, and one of them, the elder too, with his face all damaged and scarred with hard weather as the figurehead of an old ship might be, struck up a sturdy song that was like a gale in itself. Again the ghost sped on, above the black and heaving sea, on, on, until, being far away, as he told Scrooge from any shore, they lighted on a ship. They stood beside the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the officers who had the watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations. But every man among them hummed a Christmas tune, or had a Christmas thought, or spoke below his breath to his companion of some bygone Christmas day with homeward hopes belonging to it. And every man on board, walking or sleeping, good or bad, had had a kinder word for another on that day than on any day in the year, and had shared to some extent in its festivities, had remembered those he cared for at a distance, and had known that they delighted to remember him. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while listening to the moaning of the wind, and thinking what a solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness over an unknown abyss, whose depths were secrets as profound as death. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while thus engaged, to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. Ha <laughs> ha! laughed Scrooge's nephew. Ha ha ha! If you should happen, by any unlikely chance, to know a man more blessed in a laugh than Scrooge's nephew, all I can say is, I should like to know him too. Introduce him to me, and I'll cultivate his acquaintance. It's a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things, that while there is infection and disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. The Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides, rolling his head, and twisting his face into the most extravagant contortions. Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, roared out lustily. Ha-ha! 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 He said that Christmas was a humbug, as I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women, they never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was. All kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, 
and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw on any little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking, you know, but satisfactory, too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he's very rich, Fred, hinted Scrooge's niece. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. He don't do any good with it. He don't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking <laughs> that he is ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him, observed Scrooge's niece. Scrooge's niece's sisters and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his own whims? Himself, always. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He don't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everyone else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges, because they had just had dinner, and with a dessert upon the table were clustered round the fire by the lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on the subject. Whereas Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. "'Do go on, Fred,' said Scrooge's niece, clapping her hands. "'He never finishes what he begins to say. He's such a ridiculous fellow.' Scrooge's nephew reveled in another laugh, and as it was impossible to keep the infection off, though the plump sister tried hard to do it with aromatic vinegar, his example was unanimously followed. "'I was only going to say,' said Scrooge's nephew, "'that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us, and not making merry with us, is, as I think, "'and he loses some pleasant moments, which could do him no harm. "'I am sure he loses pleasanter companions than he can find in his own thoughts, "'either in his mouldy old office or his dusty chambers. "'I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. "'He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. "'I defy him. "'If he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, "'Uncle Scrooge, how are you?' If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk fifty pounds, that's something, and I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of his shaking Scrooge, but being thoroughly good-natured and not caring what they laughed at, so that they laughed at any rate, he encouraged them in their merriment and passed the bottle joyously. After tea they had some music, for they were a musical family and knew what they were about. When they sung a glee or catch, I can assure you, especially Topper, who could growl away in the bass like a good one, and never swell the large veins in his forehead or get red in the face over it. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp and played, among other tunes, a simple little air, a mere nothing you might learn to whistle it in two minutes, which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding-house, as he had been reminded by the ghost of Christmas past. When this strain of music sounded, all the things that ghost had shown him came upon his mind. He suffered more and more, and thought that if he could have listened to it often, years ago, he might have cultivated the kindnesses of life for his own happiness with his own hands, without resorting to the sexton's spade that buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty's founder was a child himself. Stop! There was a first game at Blind Man's Bluff! Of course there was, and I no more believe Topper was really blind than I believe he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is that it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew, though the ghost of Christmas present knew it, the way he went after that plump sister and the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature. Knocking down the fire irons, stumbling over the chairs, bumping against the piano, smothering himself among the curtains. Wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anyone else. You had fallen up against him, as some of them did on purpose. You would have made a feint of endeavouring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding. You would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. She often cried out that it wasn't fair, and it really was not. But when at last he caught her, when in spite of all her silken rustlings and her rapid flutterings past him, he got her into a corner whence there there was no escape. 
Ben, whose conduct was the most execrable, for his pretending not to know her, his pretending that it was necessary to touch her headdress, and further to assure himself of her identity by pressing a certain ring upon her finger, and a certain chain about her neck, was vile, monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it, when, another blind man being in office, they were so very confidential together behind the curtains. Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind man's bluff party, but was made comfortable with a large chair and a footstool in a snug corner, where the ghost and Scrooge were close behind her. But she joined in the forfeit and loved to admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. Likewise, at the game of how, when, and where, she was very great to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew, beat her sisters hollow, though they were sharp girls, too, as Topper could have told you. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge, for wholly forgetting the interest he had in what was going on, that his voice made no sound of the ears, he sometimes came out with his guesses quite loud, and very often guessed quite right, too. For the sharpest needle, best white chapel, wanted not to cut in the eye, it was not sharper than Scrooge, plant as he took it in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood, and looked upon him with such favour that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guest departed. But this the spirit said could not be done. "'Here is a new game,' said Scrooge. "'One half-hour, oh, spirit, only one!' It was a game called the Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what. He only answering to their questions yes or no, as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed listed from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, or rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes, and talked sometimes, and lived in London, and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, and didn't live in a menagerie, and was never killed in a market, was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. Every first question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter, was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, "'I have found it! I know what it is, Fred! I know what it is!' "'What is it?' cried Frank. "'It's your Uncle Scrooge!' Which it certainly was. Admiration was the universal sentiment, though some objected that the reply to, "'Is it a bear?' should have been yes, inasmuch as an answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted the thoughts from Mr. Scrooge, supposing they had ever had any tendency that way. "'He has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure,' said Fred, "'and it would be ungrateful not to drink to his health. Here's a glass of mulled wine ready to our hand at the moment. "'And I say, Uncle Scrooge! Well, Uncle Scrooge!' they cried. "'A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, wherever he is,' said Scrooge's nephew. "'He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it none the less.' "'Uncle Scrooge!' Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an audible speech if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed off from the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope, by poverty, and it was rich. An almshouse, hospital, and jail, and misery's every refuge, where vain men and his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out. He left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it were only a night, but Scrooge had his doubts of this, because the Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into the space of time as they passed together. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge observed this change, but never spoke of it, till they left a children's twelfth night party, when, looking at the spirit as they stood together in open place, he noticed his hair was grey. "'All spirits' lives so short?' asked Scrooge. "'My life upon this globe is very brief,' replied the ghost. "'It ends tonight.' "'Tonight?' cried Scrooge. "'Tonight at midnight.' Hark! The time is drawing near. The chimes were ringing the three quarters past eleven at that moment. Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, asked Scrooge, looking intently at the spirit's robe, but I'd see something strange and not belonging to yourself, protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw, for the flesh there is upon it, was the spirit's sorrowful reply. Look here. The foldings of its robe had brought two children, 
wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, and miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung to the outside of its garment. "'Oh, man, look here! Look! Look down here!' exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and girl, yellow, meager, ragged, scowling wolfish, but prostrate, too, in their humility. A graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with his freshest tints. A stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked and glared out, menacing. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity in any grade, through all the mysteries of wonderful creation as monsters half so horrible and dread.